Okay, members, the next item on the order paper is a motion on the support for the Modern Slavery Victim Support Bill. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That this Assembly notes Anti-Slavery Day 2020, which seeks to raise awareness of human trafficking today, condemns the crime of human trafficking, which tragically happens in our society, welcomes the progress Northern Ireland has made with the passage of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Criminal Justice and Support for Victims Act, Northern Ireland 2015, and the work of the Department of Justice, statutory agencies, the PSNI and civil society organisations, calls for consideration of further support for victims of trafficking beyond the end of the support provided under the National Referral Mechanism, and calls on the UK Parliament to pass the Modern Slavery, Slavery Victim Support Bill HL 2019-21, which would give confirmed victims of trafficking who find themselves in Northern Ireland leave to remain for 12 months following the National Referral Mechanism so that they can receive the support they need to recover from their ordeal and to make it possible for them to think about giving evidence against their traffickers in court, something that is essential to reverse the low conviction rates for traffickers. Thank you. I call Ms Joanne Bunting to move the motion. So moved. Thank you. Uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour thirty minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Uh, so please open debate on the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am grateful for the opportunity to open this debate on the subject of human trafficking. This Sunday, October the 18th, marks Anti-Slavery Day, a day set aside for the purpose of highlighting the tragic reality that men, women and children continue to be trafficked for the purposes of exploitation in our world today. As an aside, that's why we're aiming to have the inaugural meeting of our own APG on modern slavery next week to highlight the issue and raise awareness. And I know some members have indicated their support and interest in this matter, and I'm grateful to them for that and would encourage them to come along so that we can continue to work on this subject together. It's important to be clear what we mean when we talk about human trafficking. Human trafficking involves the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harbouring or receipt of individuals for the purposes of exploitation, for example in the sex trade, or for forced labour, for example in car washes. It can happen both within a territory and between them. People smuggling is not the same as human trafficking, for the key reason that it's not for the purposes of exploitation. It was estimated by the, the International Labour Organisation that over 40 million individuals were victims of trafficking around the world in 2016. Of course, due to the clandestine nature of this crime, it's impossible to know the exact figure. But if this number is in any way accurate, it illustrates that this is a major global problem. Members of this House will know that human trafficking happens here in Northern Ireland and right across these islands. In 2020, the Centre for Social Justice produced a new estimate suggesting that across the United Kingdom there are around 100,000 people who are potential victims of this crime each year. Again, it is important to stress that this is an estimate, as in practice it's very challenging to be certain of the numbers of individuals who are trafficked at any one time due to the very nature of the crime and the variable quality of the data available. Over the last three years in Northern Ireland, 171 potential victims of human trafficking have entered the National Referral Mechanism, or the NRM. The NRM is the formal government process set up to identify and support victims of human trafficking in the United Kingdom. Each of these 171 men, women and children has a personal story. Victims of trafficking have been identified right across this jurisdiction both in urban and rural areas. But there may be many more trafficked in Northern Ireland since it is widely recognised and accepted by the Department of Justice, statutory agencies, the PSNI and the civil society sector that this figure in no way marks out the full number of victims of trafficking in our society. It is important that I acknowledge today that Northern Ireland has a positive record in responding to this horrendous crime. We have a world-leading legislative framework which was passed through this House before I became a member. The Human Trafficking and Exploitation, Criminal Justice and Support for Victims Act, Northern Ireland 2015, 
which was introduced by my friend and party colleague Lord Morrow when he was an MLA, was the first comprehensive piece of legislation passed on this issue in the United Kingdom. It was the product of significant cross-party working, for which the Minister's predecessor, David Ford, deserves credit, as do members of other parties and Department of Justice officials. The requirement for support for victims of trafficking identified here and the provision of independent guardians for unaccompanied migrant and trafficked children are particularly noteworthy elements which go beyond what is available in England and Wales. As a member of the policing board, I'm fully aware of how seriously the PSNI takes this crime and the dedication of the officers to identifying potential victims. Moreover, we are blessed to have an active civil society seeking to respond to this crime here. I also know the Minister and her department take this crime seriously, and I was grateful to her for meeting with me and Lord Morrow earlier this year on the subject. I'm glad to see the Minister here for the debate, and I look forward to her response to the points. While there are very positive aspects to our response to human trafficking, there are ways in which we can do even better which are raised in this motion. Firstly, I want to thank the Minister for the recent consultation on extending statutory support for victims of slavery as well as those trafficked. This has been happening in practice, but these victims deserve the full support of the law. However, the Human Trafficking Act only mandates the Department to provide support during the period in which victims are going through the NRM process. The Department does have discretion to provide support beyond the point at which a conclusive grounds decision has been made, and to the credit of the Department, this has been utilised on a number of occasions. For some confirmed victims, this system works well, as they may wish to return to their home country or their circumstances do not require long-term support. However, in other cases, victims need more long-term assistance due to the trauma they've been through. A wonderful charity called Flourish in my constituency provides support to victims of trafficking who have exited the NRM. As they put it on their website, without support, clients face significant barriers to moving on. Examples of these are social isolation, re-exploitation, homelessness, poverty, mental health issues, alcohol or substance misuse, and a general lack of capacity to thrive. Many organisations who work with trafficking victims argue they need longer term support for their recovery. These individuals have been exploited here and providing further support may help to provide a sounder footing for victims of trafficking as they rebuild their lives and help to improve evidence collection against perpetrators of these dreadful crimes. I urge the Minister to commit to exploring with her department and the relevant civil society organisations whether further support could be provided to, vict to confirmed victims who have left the NRM. I also want to raise the Bill at Westminster, which is mentioned in the title of this motion. The Modern Slavery Victim Support Bill has been put forward by Lord Ian McCall, who has been raising the need to support victims of trafficking for over a decade. Part of his bill refers to immigration powers which are reserved to Westminster. The bill would mandate the Home Office to provide immigration leave to victims getting discretionary support under Section 18.9 of our Human Trafficking Act and also allow at least 12 months leave to remain to identified victims of trafficking who meet certain criteria. This bill would make a difference to Northern Ireland's victims. There is no right to such support at the moment, but providing statutory immigration stability and security for confirmed victims will help prevent re-trafficking and also provide an environment in which victims would be willing to assist police investigations into their perpetrators. I hope that after hearing this debate, the Minister will use her good offices to push for this bill to be taken up by the Government in Westminster. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I hope all members of this House will support the motion today and make clear our strong condemnation of the crime of human trafficking and our strong desire to support victims who find themselves here in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Iram Sir Linda Dillon, on Kanchia. I call Linda Dillon. Gormano, good lish, can call you, and can I thank the members for bringing this motion to the House, and we will be supporting the motion. I suppose, first of all, to say that there has been much discussion in recent times around slavery and historical slavery, and whilst that's important, I think that we need to acknowledge, and people need to be very well aware, that slavery is alive and kicking, and amongst our communities and right around us. And 
everywhere we live, everywhere we work. So we need to be aware of that first and foremost, and I think we need to make our communities aware of it. And has been outlined by the member previously. Uh, as a member of the policing board, she is well aware of how important the PSNI take this. And we took, we spoke yesterday about the need for greater numbers in our police service and the fact that there needs to be a focus on neighbourhood policing and policing with the communities. And I think that is really, really important in terms of this issue because we need to recognise the signs. But police, if police officers are embedded within our communities and they know the people in the communities, they will easily spot if something is not right within that community. So it is important that that is, that is part of what they, they're doing. Modern slavery and human trafficking has been acknowledged by Detective Inspector Mark Bell from the PSNA Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit as one of the fastest, fastest growing types of crime. And this is reflected in the statistics that we're seeing now. And that again is why it is so important that we have those police officers embedded in our communities. It can take many forms, sexual exploitation, forced criminality and domestic servitude, and even the removal of organs. It's a cruel and torturous crime, probably amongst one of the most cruel and in inhumane crimes, because you're removing somebody's life, but they still have to live, which I think is absolutely the most inhumane. I'm quite certain that there are people out there who are suffering this crime at this moment in time would much prefer not to be here, and I could fully understand that. And as a mother, if it was my child, would I much prefer that they were in that life or that their life was over, I, I really would find difficulty in choosing between those two things. The Modern Slavery Bill rightly focuses on these elements and aims to provide additional support to these victims. It aims to assist them through recovery and to help them bring offenders to justice, something that is vital in our fight against this crime. And it's something that I'm happy to support. The bill will act as an important piece of legislation if passed, will aim to support victims. And I'm broadly supportive of the provisions of the bill. However, I have some concerns. But within the bill, it will, it will actively support adult victims of modern slavery and human trafficking in their physical and psychological and social recovery, and this is vitally important. It is important to include access to safe and appropriate accommodation, material assistance, including financial assistance, medical advice and treatment, counselling, a support worker, translation and interpretation services, access to legal advice and representation and assistance with repatriation. There also includes important safeguards, including this must not be conditional on the person acting as a witness in any criminal proceedings, that they must be provided in a manner which takes account of the individual needs of that person. Further still, importantly, the bill would provide a statutory leave to remain in the UK to support adult victims of modern slavery. This is a crucial safeguard that will help to support the needs of the victim and will also have the knock-on effect of bringing offenders to justice. However, I have concerns with that 12-month limit because we have no way of knowing whether the case will come to court. We know about the delays in our own legal system within that 12 months. And we don't know if they will get the support that they need within that 12 months. And equally, we don't know if they're able to return to their home. Because if they have been taken as, as, as slaves and been trafficked once, do we know what won't happen again if they're sent back to where they came from? Do we know that those criminals that did this to them won't have access to them, won't have access to their families? We're well aware that this is one of the biggest threats that is held over these people, is that we know where your families live. Some of them have children at home and they're being told we know where your children are. So we have to look at this in the round and I'm not sure that the 12 months allows sufficiently for that and I would have real concerns. Many of them have been separated from their friends and families whose lives have moved on and is there a home for them to, to go back to? So the 12 months I think is welcome. We will support the motion today. However, I would much prefer to see that leave to remain indefinite if it's needed to be so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the motion and join with others, other members in this in condemning the apparent scourge of modern slavery has on our society. I hope that this debate does help to raise awareness about the realities of life for victims of modern slavery who find themselves pushed into forced labour, domestic servitude and sexual exploitation. 
I also hope that the support from this Assembly can help to ensure the UK Government gives the private members' bill the time to progress through Parliament. And if this motion passes, which I sincerely hope it does, I suggest a letter from the Justice Minister to the Home Secretary highlighting that would be helpful. The UK Home Office's responsibility for combating modern slavery comes into conflict with its zealous immigration enforcement. The latter, unfortunately, takes priority, despite the fact that a precarious immigration status is itself something that makes someone vulnerable to exploitation and can be the reason they do not seek help. The bill builds on the landmark 2015 Modern Slavery Act, and I must take the opportunity to pay tribute to the work of the former SDLP MP for Foyle, Mark Durkin, who did on it as the only MP from Northern Ireland on the Bill Committee as the treasurer of the all-party group on modern slavery and human trafficking. The Bill would strengthen that legislation by ensuring victims had at least 12 months, and I do take the points raised by the member, but the extension from 45 days to 12 months does create a, a broader window of time to answer some of those very important questions you raise. I will indeed, yes. Member agree with me that we as a community on this day and age in 2020 should have tolerance for those that are, are, are committing these crimes and all of the help that we possibly can give as a community and society should be outreached to those that have suffered this evil crime. Member has an extra minute. I thank you for your intervention, Mr. Catney, and agree wholeheartedly. Any right thinking person is disgusted by, by what's in front of us today. But that extension to, ex to at least 12 months to receive the guaranteed support after identification by the national referral mechanism, rather than the paltry 45 days at present. Although progress has been made, the numbers of victims identified since the 2015 legislation came into force, the support has simply not been there to prevent victims becoming destitute or homeless or even re-trafficked and enslaved. 45 days is not only an arbitrary figure, it is a shockingly inadequate amount of time to recover from the mental trauma and often violent physical abuse inflicted on victims on modern slavery, let alone enough time to help them rebuild some semblance of a stable life after slavery. As the motion rightly notes, this isn't only the right thing to do for victims, it would also strengthen enforcement and hopefully improve conviction rates by increasing the likelihood that victims will feel enough confidence in themselves and in the justice system to give evidence against the perpetrators. Providing leave to remain for at least a year would shift away from the 45-day cliff edge to a needs-based tailored system which the Work and Pension Select Committee and charity supporting victims of trafficking, trafficking and modern slavery support. I hope that Anti-Slavery Day and this debate marking it can act as a reminder to the public at large of the signs of modern slavery and human trafficking so that we can all be alert to them. By recognising the signs of modern slavery, we as, a pub, as public representatives and our constituents can make the work of the PSNI and other public bodies even more effective and help to bring the perpetrators to justice. It is by equipping as many people as possible to spot the signs of this dehumanising crime that we begin to dismantle that power. That is why I welcome the guidance issued to local councils to help their workers identify signs of modern slavery. Similarly, I would be grateful to hear from the Minister what assessment she has made for the guidance to become available to other public bodies in identifying slavery. I am particularly thinking about staff in the Jobs and Benefits offices, given that we know the controlling of someone's benefits is a known tactic by the gangmasters. I am also conscious that the bill itself deals with the fact that children can be victims and of this appalling crime. Has any thought been given to specific guidance on identifying those child victims? Finally, I am sure the Minister will be conscious that at the end of the year we will become the only part of the UK that will have a land border with an EU country.
which could make us a target for enslavers and traffickers who see an opportunity in the loss of the European arrest warrant. It is absolutely vital that there is a robust north-south cooperation on this to ensure our capabilities and enforcement are not reduced. I welcome the Minister's thoughts on that. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Doug Beattie. Mr Speaker, uh, I think this is a good motion. Uh, I think it's a good debate. Uh, and I think there's some great points coming out, and no doubt we'll hear uh, some more really good points from um, people who are far more learned uh, than I am. But with your permission, Mr. Speaker, uh, I wonder if I could maybe just go out of lane slightly because uh, I have seen uh, human slavery and trafficking at its start point. Uh, I was in Kosovo uh, in 1999 as part of Op Agricola, um, trying to secure that while ethnic cleansing uh, and criminal gangs. Uh, were rife. Uh, I went to uh, a car showroom just outside the town of Prison uh, with uh, Italian Carabinieri. Uh, Prison is just close to uh, the border with uh, Albania and uh, North Macedonia. Of course, it wasn't North Macedonia then, it was was the Federal Yugoslav Republic uh, of Macedonia. And in that car showroom, uh, there was no cars. The cars had either been uh, stolen or sold, probably stolen then sold. But there was another commodity, and that was a commodity of people. And it was mostly women, some as young as 14 years of age. They were being kept in inhumane conditions. They had been beaten. They had been sexually assaulted. They had been starved. They had been drugged. And you may think that I've seen a movie where it says something like that, and you probably have seen a movie where it looks like that, but let me tell you, it's nothing like it when you come across the real thing, when you see these bodies huddled together, fearful and frightened. That smell of body odour, alcohol, drugs, toilets full of human faeces backed up because there's no sanitary sanitary conditions there. Piss-stained mattresses, piss-stained clothing. That coppery taste of blood on your tongue that you kind of imagine, but it's actually there from the beatings and the women not being given menstrual products. That feeling of fear, that feeling of hopelessness, that feeling of despair of those poor, wretched beings. I saw similar in 1995 uh, when I was in Bosnia uh, when the Dayton Agreement was being signed. The Dayton Agreement created a space for criminal gangs to operate in, and yes, they did operate, and their target was young women for sexual exploitation. I went back to Bosnia in 2004, and it was still happening. They had just got more sophisticated. When I return to 1999 and I think about that, of those women that I found in that car showroom, um, it took six days to get them to Pristina Hospital and then get them back to their families. I accompanied one of them when they went back to the family, a 19-year-old girl. And that sense of joy in the faces of her family at the return of their daughter, because they thought she'd been killed in the war. And then watched their faces turn to absolute devastation when they realise what their daughter had just been put through. It is human misery, human trafficking, exploitation, slavery. It is about human misery, and it happens here in Northern Ireland. And if we don't future-proof our legislation, it will come here more and more in the years to come. Last year, I think there was 59 cases of human trafficking. That will do nothing but increase. And those people who are responsible for it should be subject to the full rigours of the law. If they're from here in Northern Ireland, then they must get long custodial sentence to act as a deterrent. If they are not from here, if they have abused the system to come here to make a better life for themselves, only to be engaged in, in, in human trafficking and slavery, then they do their custodial sentence and then we send them home. Get them out of here. Yes, please. The member makes a, 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 a really good picture of the link between criminal gangs 
and uh, <clears throat> human trafficking. Does he believe that we, we need to target some of our efforts here towards uh, uh, looking at those international linkages between criminal gangs? Uh, absolutely. Members, because an extra it, minute. Because Northern Ireland might be the end game, but it's not the starting point because there are tra chains of people who are bringing people into Northern Ireland for human trafficking purely to make money. And that's all it's for. That human misery is to do nothing other than make money. The Ulster Unionist Party will never apologise for standing up for the victim. And if the victim wants to go home, let them go home. If they want to stay here, let them stay here and let's support them and let's give them asylum if they so need it. But let's make sure that the victim gets the choice. I'm 55, Mr. Speaker. Today is my birthday. I was in my mid-30s when I came across that scene. It has stayed with me since. But I walked away from it. Other people are still now living it. And that's why this is so important. Mm -hmm. Thank Thank you, Mr. Mr. To close. I call John Blair. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I rise on behalf of Alliance to support the motion which rightfully addresses the reality of modern slavery and in turn raises awareness. Like others, I would like to thank the members who have brought the motion to the House today. The word slavery, when considered in historic terms, conjures up images which seem relegated firmly to the past, but the reality is more people are enslaved today than at any time in history. Whether globally or locally, there are shocking statistics which also, of course, relate to real lives adversely impacted by corruption and exploitation. Last week, Mr Deputy Speaker, a United Nations report estimated that 29 million women and girls are victims of modern-day slavery, exploited by practices including forced labour, debt bondage and domestic servitude. That means one in every 130 women and girls is potentially living in modern slavery today, dehumanised and treated as a commodity or as property. Deputy Speaker, this is a global and local problem also. It is happening here in Northern Ireland. Slavery in any form has no place in modern society. We have an opportunity today to condemn practices which exploit the most vulnerable people and to condemn trafficking as a violation of basic human rights. However, I firmly believe that slavery in the modern context can be eradicated for good. And I would just like to take this opportunity to applaud the Department of Justice for the considerable research and work that has already taken place on tackling human traffic, trafficking, for the important work of contracted providers for their support services, and for the progress the Department has made towards eliminating slavery from the modern day locally. I'm sure the Minister, when she responds, will give us more detail on some of those issues. I must also, Deputy Speaker, commend the work of the PSNI Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit, which, with other agencies across this island and beyond, has continued to work with an increasing number of referrals and so has helped more of those who are exploited and suffering. This work, sometimes publicised, though often not, is taking place across our constituencies and will be aided by awareness raising such as today's motion and debate. The motion calling for increased protection through the National Referral Mechanism seeks to extend the period of protection for those most in need due to modern slavery, exploitation and servitude, those most vulnerable and in need of time to recover and also to assist in investigations into the crimes. Amending Section 18 will build on work done in 2016 by my predecessor David Ford, then as Justice Minister, to extend assistance and support to potential victims of slavery. It will also enhance and extend the work done by members and former members, such as that outlined uh, by Joanne Bunting in proposing the motion today. <clears throat> Deputy Speaker, we acknowledge Anti-Slavery Day 2020 as an assembly and the important work of other organisations in raising awareness of human trafficking and campaigning against slavery in this modern day. With colleagues on these benches, I am happy to support the motion. I call Gordon Dunn. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I too welcome the debate on this very important motion today. And I would associate myself with the excellent speech made by my colleague, Jaman Bunting. As a member of this House during the passage of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act, 
I am, pleased, I am pleased to say that it was a bill that illustrated this House at its collaborative best, showing what can be done when we all work together. Today I want to raise two points specifically, Mr Deputy Speaker. Firstly, the question of whether slavery and trafficking risk orders should be introduced here. In her recently published annual report, Dame Sarah Thornton, the independent anti-slavery commissioner, stated that, and I quote, in Northern Ireland, the legislation did not include slavery and trafficking risk orders. But I urged the Minister for Justice when I met her in February 2020 to reconsider their value, as evidence as effective use in England and Wales and Scotland emerges. I know that during the passage of the Human Trafficking Act, the Department consulted on introducing these orders, but opted not to introduce them due to concerns about civil liberties, as they can be imposed without a conviction, unlike the slavery and trafficking prevention orders. Mr. Speaker, I think, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think the time has come for the Department to reconsider whether such risk orders should be introduced. I note that in 2019, 2019 report of the Independent Review of the Modern Slavery Act 2015 was very positive about the risk orders and encouraged their greater use in England and Wales. I hope that in due course we will hear from the Justice Minister that she has committed her department to review whether Northern Ireland should introduce such risk orders. Secondly, I would like to raise my concern, which has already been mentioned, about the low number of convictions secured for human trafficking offences here. We have victims and offences numbered in the hundreds, but in the last three years, only nine individuals have been persecuted for trafficking offences and only four convictions secured. This will be a concern to members around this House as if, as if perpetrators are not apprehended and punished for this crime, perpetrators will deem it worth the risk to engage in this kind of activity. I know that persecuting these crimes can be very difficult, and I am hoping the Justice Minister will be able to comment later on why she thinks we have been unable to secure more convictions and what action her department can take to improve matters. I hope she will write to the members who have spoken today and to the Justice Committee about the issues raised. I would also ask her to tell members when the PPS will publish guidance on prosecuting cases which, will still, which have still not been published five years after the Human Trafficking Act was passed. This House passed a world-leading piece of legislation that was commended in the House of Lords last week. We also need to be commended. We also need to be leading in tackling this crime by real action by ensuring the perpetrators are brought to justice. We know the criminal cases are more effectively prosecuted when the victim is able to give evidence. But without long-term support and immigration security, there is little incentive for victims who are already dealing with the trauma to get involved in the criminal case. The Northern Ireland trafficking legislation led the way in providing support to victims while they are a national referral mechanism. The Assembly had the foresight to recognise that some victims would continue to need support. It has become evident since then a longer commitment to victims is needed. I sincerely hope the, the Assembly will revisit this issue. We are, of course, constrained on how long a victim can receive services by how long a victim can legally remain here if they are not a UK national. That is why I support Lord McCall's Westminster Bill which would provide statutory immigration rights to victims so that they can stay in the UK while they receive services. I support the motion, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Iram, sir. Emma Rogan, on Kansha, I call Emma Rogan. Modern slavery is a severe exploitation of people for personal or commercial gain. Modern slavery is all around us. You just often can't see it. People can become trapped making our clothes, serving our food, picking our crops, working in factories, or even working in, in homes as cooks or cleaners or nannies. From the outside, it can look like a normal job, but they face threats of violence, inescapable debt, or have their passports taken away. Many fall into this trap simply because they're trying to escape poverty, insecurity, or even war. Many are trying to improve their lives and just support their families. 
It is estimated that 40 million people are trapped in modern slavery worldwide. One in four are children. Almost three quarters are women and girls. Modern slavery and human trafficking has been acknowledged by the PSNI's Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit as one of the fastest growing crime types in the UK. The most recent statistics released have shown that between April and October 2019, the P PSNI had 54 referrals to the National Referral Mechanism, compared to 33 at the same time in, two, in 2018. This was six and a half months only, whereas there were 59 potential victims of human trafficking identified the whole of the previous year. We expect more up-to-date figures to be published in the next couple of weeks, and whilst I hope we see a great deal of improvement, I am deeply concerned that this is ever-increasing crime is on, the neg is on a negative and dangerous path. Behind every figure is a person, a person who has a family and friends, who have a life and who have rights. Every often, very often, all of these th things are taken so cruelly by traffickers who then exploit their victims. It rips apart the lives of the victims and robs them of their human rights. The Department of Justice and the Assembly have done a lot of work on tackling modern slavery and human trafficking, which is very welcome. It aims to prevent, prevent people from getting drawn into slavery by reducing the vulnerability of those who may be tra trafficked, targeted by traffickers and enslavers, and ensuring that the general public is equipped to spot the signs of exploitation and report any suspicions. The former Justice Minister, Claire Sugden, stated in the second annual Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery Strategy, I recognise that a complete eradication of this crime is an aspirational aim, but one which we should all strive towards in delivering this strategy. The House of Lords Bill will assist us in our efforts to deliver on this aim, but for this reason I am happy to support this motion. However, I want to echo the concerns of my colleagues that the 12-month limit to the statutory provision of support in this bill is not enough, nor is the 12 months leave to remain. I thank the member for giving way, and uh, I think it's right that every member in this House would obviously condemn uh, modern slavery in all its forms. I, I ask this as a rhetorical question. How many members of the House have used the unregulated car washes or will use the unregulated car washes in the future where it is known that, that modern slavery has in fact taken place? Members, next a minute. Thank the member for his, his intervention. Um, I noted earlier that the vast array of implications of modern slavery can have on victims, and with such impacts are so profound, it is unfair to expect a full recovery to take place in such a short time. I would like to see a statutory requirement on the state to provide support and leave to remain for as long as it is necessary to facilitate the victim's recovery. Nonetheless, I do support this motion. Although in this House last week a member said that it was not the time for strategies, but now is the time for this strategy, now is the time to get this right. A great saying that sometimes I think we need reminding of, a goal without a plan is only a wish. And people who are subjected to trafficking and modern slavery do need much more than just a wish. Thank you very much. I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And I commend the member for... Uh, East Belfast and my colleague and friend Joanne Bunting for bringing this debate here today. A very good debate and it's good that we have a good consensus across this House. The Conservative peer Lord McCall, a long-standing campaigner for the rights of trafficked individuals, has tabled the Modern Slavery Victim Support Bill which is awaiting debate in the House of Lords currently. The bill has two aims. It would provide statutory support for potential victims of trafficking in England and Wales during the national re referral mechanism process. This would bring this jurisdiction into line with what we already have here in Northern Ireland. Uh, the bill also uh, has an impact on the immigration status of confirmed victims of trafficking identified here. And as members know, immigration is a matter reserved for Westminster. In passing, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would note the comments made by Lord Kennedy of Southwark representing the Labour front bench in the debate on the Westminster Immigration Bill last week. Uh, he stated that Northern Ireland's legislation on trafficking is generally regarded as more superior 
to the legislation in force here in England and Wales. I'm on to call for England and Wales to follow what we have done here in terms of support for victims. I would add my voice to this call as well. And of course, we should commend ourselves in this House when we make historic and brave decisions around legislation. And at that point, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me commend Lord Morrow, for he saw something before anybody else saw it. And he's seen a route uh, in order through legislation to provide resolution and safety for people and for victims. And I commend Lord Morrow for his foresight in his cutting edge bill, which really made a difference to this jurisdiction and to the people who are victims. Uh, Lord McCall's bill would provide immigration leave for confirmed victims in two circumstances. Firstly, during the time an individual receives discretionary support under Section 18.9 of the Human Traffic and Exploitation Act. And secondly, if a victim who meets particular criteria could receive leave to remain and recourse to public funds for at least 12 months. Being identified as a victim of trafficking does not currently provide any right to remain in contrast to welcome provision for refugees, where recognition as a refugee grants an initial period of five years' leave to remain in the UK. It is the case that currently discretionary leave to remain can be granted to victims of trafficking. However, it is only granted where victims are not eligible for any other form of leave. Uh, yes, I will. Yeah. Taking the intervention, would the member agree with me that this is a persistent problem, that the leave to remain, particularly for, for women in these circumstances, and also, as we discussed recently, the domestic abuse bill, we recognise that that's an issue. So there, there's a real issue in this for, for bringing perpetrators to justice. Member, an extra minute. Yes, uh, and thank you for that intervention, and I do agree with that. We do need to look at this again and, and resolve this issue. Uh, once and for all. And remember, when we pass legislation, it's not set in stone. It can be amended and it can be improved upon. And the agility that that brings, I think, should be welcomed and pushed and, and persevered through. Um, victims of all nationalities, including British citizens, are trafficked in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, there is no data on how many victims have leave to remain or not. <coughs> We do know that the UK government considers discretionary leave to remain as an option only in exceptional circumstances. Different data sources suggest that only 8 or 12 per cent of victims get discretionary leave. The needs of EU victims post-Brexit were recognised by the House of Lords last week in a vote to ensure that victims get leave to remain if they meet very similar criteria to that currently applied for discretionary leave. EU victims are trafficked into Northern Ireland. So currently Clause 12 of the Westminster Immigration Bill will impact victims here. But these sorts of immigration rights should be available to all nationalities as needed. Some victims will want to return home, but others who are currently required to leave the UK will be required uh, under circumstances that led them to being vulnerable to trafficking in the first place. This is why I support the Modern Slavery Victim Support Bill, as the immigration rights it would provide, would apply to all victims, regardless of nationality. Clause 2 of the bill would help to reduce the risk of individuals being re-trafficked, would provide much need needed certainty and stability for victims who often have gone through deeply traumatic experiences, and may enable victims to provide more evidence to the PSNI for the purpose of seeking prosecutions. I hope members across the House can and will support this motion today and show the government that this would be a positive move forward for victims here. It is a global issue. It is a global problem. But let Northern Ireland and let the UK play its part in bringing an end to modern traffic and slavery. Thank you. Aram Sir Gemma Dolan. I call Ger Gemma Dolan. Gourmet, I'll get last can call you. According to Anti-Slavery International, slavery is so common that it is possible you come across victims on a regular basis. This is an inexcusable abuse of basic human rights. People can become entrapped into cleaning houses and flats, producing the clothes we wear, picking the fruit and vegetables that we eat, digging for the minerals used in our smartphones and makeup, and working on construction sites. Many, many victims can become entrapped in the sex industry 
being horribly exploited into forced prostitution, criminality and in some cases even organ removal. Human trafficking can affect anyone of any age, gender or nationality. In many cases, people are forcibly removed from their homeland and away from their family and friends to be exploited in another country. Many of them end up on our shores, being trafficked under our very noses. Between 2017 and 2020, the PSNA have recorded 108 human trafficking and exploitation crimes in this jurisdiction. Over the last three years, nine individuals have been prosecuted for human trafficking offences and four convictions have been secured. I appreciate that these are often very complex cases and the PSNA and PPS take these cases very seriously. However, the low conviction rates remain a matter of significant concern. And something that can reverse this, or at least aim to tackle it, is to give victims the support they need to recover from their ordeal and to make it possible for them to think about giving evidence against their traffickers in court. Modern slavery affects people of every colour, age and gender, but it is more prevalent among vulnerable people. Therefore, within the pursue, protect and prevent approach within the Modern Slavery Strategy 2019-2020, I find the prevent strand particularly imperative. Reducing the threat of modern slavery by reducing vulnerability and demand and by raising awareness is critical. Peter May, the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Justice, got it in one when he said, and I quote, We recognise the need to prevent people from getting drawn into slavery in the first place by reducing the vulnerability of those who may be targeted by traffickers and enslavers, ensuring that the general public is equipped to spot the signs of exploitation and report any suspicions and by seeking to tackle demand. Modern slavery, slavery is very much a hidden issue, with many people oblivious to the fact that this incredulous crime is happening right under our noses. Therefore, awareness raising must be an increasingly important task. I welcome the Department of Justice awareness raising campaign, which has seen them work in partnership with local councils, the emergency services, public and private organisations, and a wide range of civil sector organisations. It's important that we continue to educate the public and importantly ourselves to be alert to the signs that someone may be a victim and to report suspicious activity to the PSNA or the Modern Slavery Helpline. Our legislation was commended in Westminster when it was remarked that the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act 2015 is genuinely regarded as more superior to the legislation in force in England and Wales. But we must not become complacent. The harsh reality is that cold and cruel traffickers and enslavers are continuing to operate here. So as we approach Anti-Slavery Day on the 18th of October, I echo the call in the motion for the British Parliament to pass the Modern Slavery Bill, and we must remember that everyone, everywhere, has the right to a life free from slavery. Aram Sir Colin McGrath on Kanchi. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak today on this important motion. Uh, human trafficking is a scourge, and we must absolutely and unequivocally condemn. There is no justification for this evil, which continues to permeate and infect us. A tragedy of this is that we may never know the full extent and depth of those who have been trafficked against their will, uh, as the crime often goes unreported. It is a crime that mocks us uh, as its victims and survivors are out in the open while the perpetrators cowardly hide in the shadows. And while we are discussing human trafficking today, let us not forget that modern slavery has many forms and hides behind many other faces. It is found in the trafficking of people into crime, but also men, women and children into children forced into sexual exploitation. It is found in domestic slavery or forced labour and many other different guises. And let me reiterate that I absolutely and utterly condemn the faceless cowards who would traffic adults and children against their will. And in all the contributions that we have heard here today, they address those who willingly perpetrate this evil and those who have survived it. Member Certainly. Thanks very much. And thank you. And I want to, Mr. Speaker, to thank everyone for their contributions. 
I mean, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking as a father and a grandfather, uh, three children, three grandchildren, and not only those that find themselves taken away from the family, but those families that are left behind, the pain and the grief and the wondering where they are, where their children are. And that's why I have to say to you, and all of you that have contributed this, zero tolerance. That is what we need to send that message out from this House today. Thank you. Members, next extra minute. I thank the, uh, my colleague for his contribution and how that actually reminds us and puts on this the fact that these individuals are members of families. They are brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, relatives that um, are taken away uh, and abused, uh, maybe never to see their family again. Um, that's a position I think that many of us would never be able to even comprehend, but it is something that many people outside in and around our society are having to deal with. But to those cowards who perpetrate this evil, we say, you will be exposed for your crimes. We will catch up with you eventually. And to the heroes that have survived these crimes, we say, your strength has inspired so many other people to act, and you are deserving of our thanks. But Mr Deputy Speaker, the motion before us today comes with two caveats that we should be aware of and be cautious of. The first is the legislation itself. Now, yes, its drive is to support, which I welcome, but it also contains a clause that says a person may be refused immigration bail assistance and support or leave to remain if the Secretary of State considers that the person poses a genuine, present and serious risk to members of the public. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, given the Home Secretary's threat to withhold food from Ireland, and her present stupid and frankly dangerous rhetoric on immigration itself, uh, it does not instill me with any confidence. And this leads to the second caveat, that while I have every confidence in a great many of the members of Parliament, there exists a number of them, and mostly on the front, front benches of the present government, whose track record on human rights is beyond abhorrent. I mean, what sort of government would willingly change a system which allows child refugees to stay uh, united with their family here in the UK and Ireland? What does it say about the UK that, it's cur that it currently only accepts 1% of the refugees across the world, or that it would willingly pursue such a reckless Brexit process which will cause further complications? And no, Mr Deputy Speaker, the present occupier of number 10 is not one that we should look to when seeking legislation that champions and embraces human rights. I do, and we do, support this motion, but I would suggest that when we do call on the UK Parliament to pass this legislation, that we do so in the strongest terms possible. I suggest that we act as a good friend and remind them of where they have fallen short in the past. And finally, I would suggest that should the UK Parliament pass this legislation, that I do not think for one moment that it will excuse the UK Government of its past abuses of human rights around the world and here in Ireland. Thank you. Iram Sir Emma Sheeran, Hon Kanchai. Call Emma Sheeran. Gora Mayagath, Las Kankorla, and I rise uh, to support this motion as well and welcome the consensus around the House on this issue. This Sunday, October 18th, people across the world will recognise and celebrate Anti-Slavery Day. And for many, this will be a poignant time, taking stock of and acknowledging the pain felt by generations gone before, perhaps recalling the journeys taken by ancestors chained and bound on a ship to a country that they themselves now call home. And whilst this might be the image that springs to mind when we think of the term slavery, this Sunday also serves as an opportunity to assert opposition to the slavery that still exists in our world today. Victims of human trafficking, for forced prostitution, organ donation or forced labour, people working in sweatshops and underground factories, people trapped in a familial cycle of unpaid labour or in a debt-based exploitation. All human beings, all treated as if they are not. And the nature of what we're discussing means that all of this activity is underground, conducted under a horrible cloak of darkness, and statistics are difficult to accurately obtain. But the charity Anti-Slavery estimate that 40 million people worldwide are trapped in slavery today, one in four of whom are children. Again, this is something that disproportionately affects females, as 71% of those deemed to be victims of slavery are women and girls. And the, the picture painted by uh, Mr Beatty needs no exaggeration. I will. Given the 
point that the member has just made, isn't it time that we looked, in, and in relation to the domestic abuse bill, isn't it time that we now looked at a women and girls strategy? Because we, in terms of this type of crime and some of the most degrading and inhumane crimes that exist, it improportionately affects women and girls. We now need to look seriously as an executive as, and as, as an assembly at a women and girls strategy. Members, an extra minute. Thank the member for intervention and definitely agree with that. Um, what Mr Beatty painted w was a sobering and, and depressing uh, reality um, and it's just a thought for us. When we think of the strides uh, forward that the women's movement has made internationally and how many glass ceilings we've broken in order to attain equality on many fronts, including the battle for equal pay for an equal day's work, it begs belief that we're still ha we still have human beings who are treated like they're in a chain gang, breaking rocks for a road that they never get to walk on. The Act, as passed in 2015, no doubt provided significant support to victims, but further work is needed. COVID-19 has had an impact on the detection of cases, just as it has on everything else this year. We can see from the statistics that the NRM received 2,209 referrals in the second quarter of 2020, a 23% decrease in referrals from the first quarter of the year. And as we all went into lockdown, uh, those engaged in exploitation, it seems, were allowed greater cover. One story which uh, resulted in the convictions of eight human traffickers last July in Poland demonstrates how these crime gangs prey on the desperation and vulnerability of their victims before trapping them in a cycle of despair. The gang trafficked their victims to England on a promise of a better life, but the account of one such victim, a former Foreign Legion soldier, told of a journey into the UK which quickly turned into enslavement, beatings and starvation a loss of dignity and an all-out attack on human decency. It's often said that you can ju judge society by how it treats the most vulnerable. If we turn a blind eye to the plight of those entrapped in slavery, we are given a damning indictment of ourselves. The British government, once the authority of the biggest empire in the world, the leading colonial power, who themselves were responsible for the entrapment of so many into slavery across the world, would go some way to righting the wrongs of the past by passing this bill. And I'd echo at this point the remarks of uh, Sinead Bradley in condemning the British government's hostile environment policy, which, which does nothing uh, to, to um, guard against the, the fear that is felt by, by those who are desperate to to escape from whatever it is that they're trying to get away from. We welcome the requirement that it would put on statute to support adult victims in their physical, psychological and social recovery, including access to accommodation and financial assistance. But the leave to remain in the UK for 12 months does not, in our opinion, go far enough, as my colleagues have previously stated. There's no way to prescribe an appropriate recovery time. You can't force someone to recover from, from this sort of an experience within a scheduled time frame. So we would support provisions which enable support and leave to remain for an unlimited period, which would effectively support recovery. But uh, we do support the motion. And thank you for your time. Called Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm not going to repeat what so many have said, but I think it is worth pointing out that trafficking and modern slavery is a disgusting underbelly of criminal activity that affects not just Northern Ireland, but across the world. Um, it is right on Anti-Slavery Day this Sunday, as many others have said, that we raise further awareness of trafficking. And for, mo for most people out there, they sort of think that this has to be somebody who is brought into this country, who is stolen against their will, but quite often it's not just those people. There are people here within society in Northern Ireland today, tomorrow and the next day who are affected by trafficking. You only have to sit, unfortunately, and watch the cars pull up outside some of our children's homes to see some of the traffickers who are taking our children out, plying them full of drugs and selling them for sex. We have car washes, as has been mentioned by Mr Newton. We have nail bars, we have domestic service. We have people who are being sold for sex on a regular basis today in Northern Ireland. There are organisations who I have the absolute privilege to know, and some of you very, thank you very much for um, a number of years ago attending an invisible traffic um, event that we had in the Long Gallery here, where we heard the harrowing experience of a lady from Belfast who had been taken by somebody who she thought she loved and sold for five years into the sex um, prostitution in Dublin. Um, this is not something that's always people who come from outside. It is people who are doing it here and now and every day. 
I would love to see um, not just the Minister for Justice, but, but the whole executive take a real committed effort to get rid of, uh, getting rid of trafficking. For instance, I would love, as you, many of you know, I'm a geek on transport. I would love to see the Certificate for Professional Competence for haulage drivers include a section that makes them aware of trafficking and ensures that they know they do not carry people as produce in their lorries. I would love to see more coming from health to stop those children's homes, allowing drug dealers taking our children away. But we do need to find the victim and we do need to give them support. We, it is vitally important that the public know how to spot the signs that these traffickers, who are men and women, they are the people who are making these victims' lives intolerable. And I appreciate that Lord McCall of Dulwich has proposed in his private member's bill in 2017, and it's been reintroduced in January 2020, that he sought to amend the Modern Slavery Act by extending the time a victim is entitled to support to 12 months, and his bill sought to guarantee leave to remain for the victims during that time. But the UK government has already said it does not support leave to remain. So I asked the Minister today if she could let us know about the work that she's able to do, any action that she can do to support victims here. I would like her to know that I do absolutely thank her, her department, the statutory agencies, the police and civic society organisations like Invisible Traffic who operate a dedicated support for those who have been trafficked and who raise awareness in schools, with businesses and with the haulage industry and with ports. I am absolutely astonished that something like Invisible Traffic goes out and they talk to those people who work up at our, up at our ports to recognise the sign of a victim to person or a trafficked person by looking out for people who don't have any language skills to be able to speak to anyone, who try to get um, safe words that can be used to people on reception desks to let somebody know that they have been trafficked there to watch out for people who don't lift their head, who keep their heads down, who are constantly looking at that person who's threatening them to keep quiet. It is time that we stop this in Northern Ireland. It is time that we supported our agencies to ensure that they can support our victims. We shouldn't send them home back to some sort of life that will only end up bringing them back here again. We shouldn't let looked after children be treated in the way that we do. We have the opportunity here and now as, an, as a whole assembly to say we support the motion. We want to see something better, and we want to see victims supported. Thank you. I call Claire Bailey, and the member has up to four minutes. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and yes, as we've heard, human trafficking is the fastest growing trade in the world, and the second largest criminal trade in the world after arms, people and weapons. It's a global trade with huge profits. And at this very moment, as has been mentioned, 40 million people are estimated to be living as slaves across the world. And I want to thank Mr Beatty for giving us all a very vivid and powerful picture of a lived reality for many of these people. And we should not, members, ever let that picture go. But if I could do anything to add to it, I would invite you to consider the animal that pays to abuse those victims. We don't have a true picture of the extent of this evil in Northern Ireland, but it is here, and we do know that 59 victims of trafficking were identified here in Northern Ireland in 2018, while members 15 of those were children. These victims require our support. They require justice, legal redress, compensation. Victims of trafficking and slavery still face significant levels of practical barriers to obtaining compensation, for example, for the abuses committed against them. Current systems have to be adjusted to accommodate a victim-centered approach that ensures legal remedies and compensation for victims. The National Referral Mechanism is a framework for identifying and re referring potential victims of modern slavery and ensure that they receive the appropriate support that grants them 45, a 45-day 45 reflection and recovery period. But it's a caseworker that then decides whether they get referred, um, those individuals get referred and should be considered victims of trafficking. Well, all children, irrespective of their immigrated status, are entitled to safeguarding and protection under law. Children who have been trafficked do not have to go through this mechanism. However, sectoral organisations have expressed major concerns at the national referral mechanism that involves poor decision making, a worrying lack of child-specific knowledge and child safeguarding, 
an inappropriate focus on immigration, a lack of training, lack of formal recovery and reflection period, and specialist support for children. So I'm adding my, my voice to calls for support beyond the end of the NRM. And the Green Party also call for a system to identify child victims of trafficking that is non-discriminatory and is child-centered, and that uses a model that effectively identifies trafficked children without considering their nationality or their immigration status, that builds on existing child protection structures that recognizes child trafficking as child abuse, and that recognizes a child cannot give informed consent in relation to exploitation. The Modern Slavery Bill will give victims of trafficking a guaranteed right to remain for a minimum of 12 months, as we've discussed. But, after, but as we know, this is intended to also allow for victims to receive support and perhaps give evidence in court. Well, often court cases can take an awful lot longer than the year to complete, and we know that very well here. But furthermore, returning the survivor, as we've talked about, to their home country can result in many um, re-traumatisation, for example. Survivors can experience stigma. They can be blamed for their own victimisation. They face discrimination in seeking housing or employment. We listen to them, we hear them, we know this. So in conclusion, I suppose I welcome and I do support this motion. And I would like to use this opportunity to pay tribute to every single victim, every single survivor of human trafficking, and for every person working to support them, and those working to tackle this crime head on. We know that we have a very real challenge ahead of us. Modern slavery must be tackled by robust support for victims, prevention of re-trafficking, and a redoubling of our efforts to secure prosecutions of traffickers. Ask the member to draw remarks Thank to you a very close, much. Please. The Minister for Justice, Naomi Long, uh, to respond, and the Minister is up to 15 minutes. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I am very grateful to the members for bringing this motion before the House and welcome the opportunity to respond today. As the comments show in this debate, there is unanimous support across this Assembly for ensuring the response to tackling human trafficking and modern slavery in Northern Ireland is robust and that our support for those affected is victim-centred. It is abhorrent that slavery in any form is happening today. Tackling modern slavery and human trafficking is a key priority for me as Justice Minister, and so I welcome the opportunity to share what we have been doing, working in partnership with law enforcement partners and with civil society. In terms of our strategic response, I have recently concluded consultations on two proposed changes to our human trafficking legislation, both of which consultees were overwhelmingly supportive. Firstly, to amend Section 12 to enable a three-year rather than an annual strategy to be developed, and secondly, to amend Section 18 to extend support to victims of slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour. These amendments will enhance our strategic response and further secure the support that is provided to victims. I have recently shared the outcome of the consultation with the Justice Committee and will provide for the changes in the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. While the Department of Justice leads on tackling modern slavery, we work with a wide range of other statutory and civil society partners, as reflected in our refreshed Modern Slavery Strategy for next year, which, I which will be issuing for public consultation later this week. We also recognise the linkages between organised crime and immigration, which others have raised in the debate today. Modern slavery is dealt with via the organised crime task force structures, which include border force and immigration. Mm -hmm. Support and protection for victims of modern slavery, however, is central to the strategy, with continued focus on building capacity among frontline professionals to help them recognise the signs of modern slavery and make the appropriate referrals. The draft strategy also places an emphasis on pursuing those responsible for these heinous crimes. Those cases are extremely complex and securing a prosecution is challenging. The fact that there have been only four convictions under the human trafficking legislation over the last three years underlines this fact. Where it is not possible to secure prosecutions for trafficking, other offences, however, are considered. 
A number of investigations each year relate to potential victims who are declaring historic modern slavery or human trafficking occurring in other countries. While these investigations are taken forward as far as possible, they may be less likely to lead to prosecutions and convictions due to the length of time which has elapsed, due to the changes of investigations relating to conflict zones or through lack of evidence such as a named offender. The PSNI have, over recent years, enhanced their capacity to tackle these crimes and will, along with other law enforcement agencies, continue to pursue offenders using all available tools. In parallel with work to pursue offenders, it's equally important that we raise awareness of these crimes to prevent and detect them at an early stage and to support and protect the victims. So turning first to the support for adult victims, Section 18 of the Human Trafficking Act sets out the assistance and support provided to all adult potential victims whose cases are being assessed through the National Referral Mechanism. The support and assistance provided includes appropriate and safe accommodation, financial assistance, health care services, translation and interpretation services, assistance in obtaining legal advice or representation, and assistance with repatriation where that is required. Over the last six years, a total of almost 250 people have been supported, and in 2019-20, of the 81 people who entered support, 71 of them received support for periods in excess of 90 days, and in most cases closer to a year, which is the average length of time it takes for the single competent authority to make a conclusive decision. Standards of victim support here have been enhanced through the re-procurement of our central support contract in 2018, when Belfast and Lisburn Women's Aid and Migrant Help were successful in securing the support contract for a three-year period. In order to ensure that potential victims of trafficking were safeguarded during the COVID-19 crisis, I approved a temporary extension of support for adult victims of modern slavery who were due to exit our support. I will return in a little more detail to the support provided to adult victims of human trafficking when I address the second part of this motion. However, turning to support for child victims of human trafficking and modern slavery, there are cross-agency operational arrangements in place to safeguard child victims or potential victims of modern slavery and human trafficking here. These arrangements include the immediate appointment of an independent guardian for all such children, including internally trafficked children for whom no one is exercising parental responsibility. The independent guardian service is intended to strengthen the overall safeguarding and care arrangements for child victims or potential child victims of trafficking. Specific functions of independent guardians include assisting and supporting these children um, and young people by listening to their views and making representation to and liaising closely with all other relevant agencies to secure their immediate future care and protection. In 2019-20, 14 referrals were made to the National Referral Mechanism in respect of potential child victims of modern slavery. Mr Deputy Speaker, Sunday was also International Day of the Girl, and so it is right that members have reflected that the power imbalances and gender inequalities in our world make women and girls vulnerable to human trafficking and slavery. What we do in terms of delivering equality also helps to protect those vulnerable people. As we approach National Anti-Slavery Day on the 18th of October, this motion provides an excellent opportunity to shine a spotlight on the issues and allows Northern Ireland Assembly to play its part in raising awareness of this abhorrent crime. There is extensive work being taken forward by statutory and non-statutory partners to raise awareness of the indicators of slavery and human trafficking and to help people feel more confident about spotting and reporting suspicious activity. My department has invested in raising awareness with the frontline workers, which coupled with proactive operational work by the PSNI's Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Unit helps uncover more incidences of potential modern slavery. First responders all receive annual training and in recent months a new online resource designed specifically for first responders has now been developed and rolled out. The public's ability, however, to identify and report suspicions is crucial and to recognise that they too, with their choices, and people have referred, for example, to car washes and other, um, other risk, high-risk areas, that they have a role in addressing it too. We have joined with partners on the Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking subgroup of the OCTF to deliver a Twitter campaign running this week, and the Department plans over the coming year to roll out, in conjunction with NILGA, further awareness training to frontline council workers and PCSPs. 
Also, further assessment of the training needs of Frontline um, Department for Community Staff and Benefits Office will be progressed as part of next year's strategy. In 2019-2020, um, national referral mechanism referrals almost doubled, and greater awareness of the signs and indicator of modern slavery is likely to have contributed to this. In terms of future policy development, and to address one of the key elements of the motion, I broadly agree with the call for consideration of further support for victims of trafficking. And I want to look into this and further to ensure that we continue to provide an individualised needs-based approach. We have a discretionary power to extend support and assistance after a positive conclusive decision in cases where it is considered necessary to do so. And over the past four years, this discretion has been used on 23 occasions. Support under the Human Trafficking Act is not intended to be permanent. Support providers work with individuals from when they enter support to identify longer term stable plans for when they exit that support. But I think we're all agreed that victims need and deserve support to help them recover and move on from their traumatic experiences. And that sometimes this can only be delivered over a longer period of time than is currently provided for. That is why I've indicated through the draft 2021-22 Modern Slavery Strategy my intention to scope extended support arrangements within Northern Ireland. I've also indicated through the draft strategy my intention to examine further some issues that it was not deemed appropriate to include in our Human Trafficking Act in 2015, to which members referred earlier. These include the duty to notify provisions and slavery and trafficking risk orders. A further review of these issues will allow us to take account of evidence and experience from other jurisdictions as we decide how best to proceed in Northern Ireland. They were not originally taken forward to, 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 due to some concerns with regard to human rights. However, we now have the benefit of experience of other jurisdictions to help inform a review of that position. I've also indicated that I will take forward a review of the effectiveness of Section 22. Further, I've committed to work in partnership with relevant government departments to engage with public and private sector organisations that will be impacted by the proposed changes to tra transparency in supply chains. For any of these policy developments that require legislative change, I will obviously be engaging with the Justice Committee and revert to the Assembly as appropriate. I've only touched on just some of the work that is being undertaken um, to ensure that we're equipped to eradicate modern slavery from Northern Ireland. It's important work to which I have given priority and work that has been recognised and commended by national and international rapporteurs. But we cannot and should not be complacent. And the future policy developments that I have outlined should serve to underline that I and my department, as well as the many others we work with to tackle modern slavery and human trafficking, are not complacent. We also need to listen carefully to the voices of victims as we develop our responses and move to a longer term strategy locally will allow us to do that, I believe, more meaningfully. In terms of the second half of the motion, which calls on the UK Parliament to pass the Modern Slavery Victim Support Bill. Mr Speaker, while I'm supportive of the sentiment behind the proposals in the bill around support for victims, it is only in its early stages and I think we need to understand more about the implications of those proposals as they are taken forward. However, some of what is proposed in that bill are already in place here. We currently provide assistance and support from the point a referral is made or is about to be made up to the point which a reasonable grounds decision is made. And we continue to provide support up until a conclusive grounds decision is reached, which can take up to a year and have further discretion to extend beyond that where necessary. I have also committed to scope the potential for extended support. In relation to the proposals for support of child victims, many are provided for within the established risk assessment, care planning and safeguarding processes that we already have. And further, careful consideration will be given to the detail of the proposals in the bill and their implications. Finally, the bill touches on immigration issues. And while I personally concur with the views expressed as to the need for immigration to take into account the impact of a hostile environment policy on vulnerable victims of trafficking and slavery, you will be aware, as will members, that immigration issues are accepted matters. And I will therefore ensure that my officials keep in touch with their counterparts in the Home Office to monitor the progress of the bill and will, of course, advise the Assembly if there are any changes emanating from it that are likely to impact in Northern Ireland. 
In closing, Mr Speaker, I am encouraged by this motion and I welcome the Assembly's commitment to raising awareness of Anti-Slavery Day and the realities of modern slavery. It is important that we take every opportunity to reinforce our collective commitment to ending all forms of modern slavery and to ensure that Northern Ireland is and is recognised as a society where these gross violations of human rights are not tolerated, where criminals are pursued and prevented from causing further harm, and where victims are protected. The Department unreservedly commends its non-statutory partners for the excellent work which they do, both in support of victims and in awareness raising. As Minister of Justice, I am committed to continuing to support and invest in those collaborative efforts to equip Northern Ireland to eradicate modern slavery mm. and human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call Paul Given to wind on the motion. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Uh, apologies for missing my colleagues when they first introduced this and for some of the earlier contributions that, that members uh, made. Um, but I am pleased with uh, the speeches that have came from different members and the unanimity that exists um, in terms of tackling this heinous crime. Uh, and as we look towards uh, the weekend and marking Anti-Slavery Day, I think it was right that uh, this motion was brought forward. And I know my colleague from East Belfast and North Down were particularly keen uh, to have this debated uh, in advance of uh, this weekend coming. And I want to thank them for their commitment on this issue. Whenever we uh, look at things that have happened in the past, and I know some colleagues um, have mentioned that, and I know uh, Ms Sheeran talked about the British imperialistic state uh, and the stain in which slavery exists upon that time. Uh, and she's right. Uh, it is an appalling period of history. Um, and that can be replicated right across many areas. I think about the Republic of Ireland, women having their children forcibly removed, forced into domestic servitude and religious orders. And I think we can all look to different countries about appalling situations uh, that took place. But I am also thankful for people who, within all of those different countries, raised the banner and fought the fight and championed the cause. I think of William Wilberforce, who in the, the Parliament, month after month, raised this issue and campaigned for the abolition of slavery across the empire and was successful. And I think about what drove him to do that, and it was his Christian faith. And it was the view that every single human being has an intrinsic human value because we're all made in the image of God. And that applies to every single one of us in this chamber and right across the world. And so I'm thankful for people who have championed these issues and fought for people's liberation. I'll give way to Mr. Frew. He makes a valid point because whilst slavery has been a stain on history and in every nation, it was actually the Royal Navy that worked so hard to end, at that time, traditional sense of slavery. And if it wasn't for the Royal Navy and the British Empire, slavery at that time may not have ended. And of course, every nation, including Ireland, has had uh, their run-ins with slavery too, Ireland being a big market for slavery, slavery of Britons and Picts. Yeah, no, thank you. I thank the member for the intervention. Uh, and he, he makes that point that uh, people then wanted to make changes, uh, and changes then have been made. Uh, and that takes me even to the modern period where members have touched upon Lord Morrow, the incredible work that he done. I had the privilege to chair the Justice Committee uh, whenever the 2015 Act came into being. I could see the amount of effort and work that he put in. And he had to convince people, even in this chamber, for parts of his bill. Um, but he worked alongside everybody and with the Department of Justice and the officials at the time. And we produced legislation that rightly members have referred to as being uh, the most comprehensive on these islands. Uh, and it set the way for others to follow. And it's something that this House can be very proud of. And he worked alongside people like Podrick McLaughlin, Sinn Féin member in Donegal, who championed these issues in the Doyle and in the Shannon, and indeed was very helpful at persuading some of his northern members to get on side on some of the clauses that were contained within that bill. So we can look back to a long period of time where people have raised these issues, and we can look to people in modern times that have championed these issues, and we're very thankful for them. But importantly, we need to think most of all about the victims. And members have talked at length about the appalling uh, type of situations that the victims of this crime face. Doug Beatty spoke passionately about an experience that 
uh, has definitely left its mark upon him. And he brought it home that it, this isn't just an international thing that happens beyond our shores. It's an international network that brings it to these shores. And there are people in this country who actively seek the services of people that are forced into prostitution, that are forced into domestic servitude, that are forced into forced labour. Uh, and that then means there has to be an approach taken that is effective by our law enforcement agencies and indeed by the public. Kelly Armstrong and others and Robin Newton spoke about the need for personal choices, personal awareness, personal responsibility, and how right that they are. When we think about the clothes that we wear, the things that we're buying, where did it come from, who made it, and we need to be more informed about all of that. When there's suspicious activity and we think that just doesn't seem right, having that individual or the way that they looked and, and there must be something wrong, but do we just walk on or do we report it to the police? And then from that there needs to be the actions taken. And so when I think about the number of cases, 108 human trafficking and exploitation cases in the past three years, potentially 171 victims, it leads me to then question why have we only had nine individuals prosecuted? Um, only four convictions have been secured. Um, Gordon Dunn talked about the need for the PPS to, to have clear guidance on this issue, and uh, I think he's right. Uh, this is, at times, a complex crime. It has an international dimension to it. Um, but we need to see um, more effort being made. And I don't, for, for one minute, doubt the sincerity of the police, the public prosecution. In fact, I know from speaking to them, uh, they have a very real, genuine uh, desire to tackle this crime. But it should cause us concern, uh, the relatively low rate of prosecution and then conviction for, for these type of offences. Uh, and so I think as we conclude this debate, it's right that uh, members have spoken passionately. It has recognised the seriousness, but it also has the collective purpose behind it. And so we are asking for the, the minister, who we know shares these same concerns, we, we want to see things like the slavery and trafficking risk orders. We want to see greater support beyond the national referral uh, mechanism period. And we also want the view of this assembly to be conveyed uh, to the Home Office where we have the immigration laws. It isn't a devolved matter, but it's having an impact on how we treat the victims. And so as one voice, let it go out uh, collectively that this is something that we abhor and that we want to see properly and effectively tackled. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it, and the motion uh, is agreed. Uh, members, before we move to uh, suspend our proceedings today, uh, the, just to say the, I know the schedule has been moving around quite a bit today. So.